This is our main aim today. In 30 minutes, we're going to explore what curiosity and creativity are and how we can put this into practice in our classrooms. It doesn't get better than that, hey, Sarah? Okay, so with that in mind then, I've got a little bit of a challenge for you and participants, whether you're in Zoom, uh, on LinkedIn or on Facebook, feel free to participate as well. Okay, I'm going to show you four images and I want you to tell me how you think these images are connected. Okay, what's okay. the connection between these four? What do you think? Ooh, participants, everybody on Facebook, <laughs> please help me out. Look, I can see three things that fly. We've got lots of fly flying coming through. Freedom, that's nice. Got two blue, two brown, but to be honest, I don't know how they connect. <laughs> blue okay. whales don't fly, unless I'm yeah. wrong. They don't. So we're going to find out. Okay, I'm going to tell you in just a minute. But okay. first of all, okay. Each of these four images actually answer a question. So, for example, the blue whale is the answer to a question. What do you think the question might be? Ooh, um, is a blue whale louder than an airplane? Fantastic. All right. So if um, mosquito is the answer, what do you think the question is? Uh, which colour is it most attracted to? Oh, very good. Yeah, lovely. And what about the next one? What do you think the question is here? Eesh. Um, are all plane seats blue? Oh, it's a good question. It's not the one I was thinking of, but it's still a great okay. question. Okay, the last one. Only bird sea. Hmm. No, I haven't got this one. Pressure's on, Sarah. I haven't got it. <laughs> All right. Well, you were really close, class. So well done for that. So the first question was completely right. Is a blue whale louder or quieter than an aeroplane? Mm. The second question was, why are most plane seats blue? The third question is, what color are mosquitoes most attracted to? And finally, which are the only birds that can see the color blue? Now, the last question, we know the answer, right? What is it? It's an owl. Yeah. Did you know this? I had no idea, actually, no. Okay, so what colour are mosquitoes most attracted to? It's got to be blue, hasn't it? <laughs> yes, that's why I'm wearing pink today. All right, and <laughs> why are most plane seats blue? Do you know the answer to this one? Mm, no, why are all plane seats blue? Okay, so at this point, I'd ask my students to go and research or find the answers to the questions that they didn't know the answers to. So. The, why are most plane seats blue? It's because it relaxes the passengers. The color blue is relaxing. And is a blue whale louder or quieter than, than an aeroplane? What do you think? I'm going to guess louder. They can reach the same sound <laughs> level at 180 decibels, right? Wow. Hmm. Okay. So were you interested in finding out the answers to these questions, see? Yeah, they're cool. I like them. Okay, so what linked all of these four images then? The colour blue. Yeah. No, I know. No, exactly. Now, this comes, or oh, this is adapted from um, the Curious Kids Pupils book. It's number five in the series by Macmillan. And you've got these lovely curiosity corners in each module. And their curiosity corner is, is a blue whale louder or quieter than an aeroplane? Investigate. But we can extend this task by kind of flipping it and giving the students answers and letting them find out what the questions are. Mm. We could also do a couple of follow-on tasks, right? For example, students research the color blue and maybe they choose three facts that they think are the most interesting. They then write some short answers or show images to represent the answers and ask their partner to give the question, the flipping it that we just saw. Or they could share two facts and a myth about the colour and their partner has to guess mm. the myth. So I've got a question for you, C, and of course the participants as well. Do you think this task, all in all, promoted curiosity or creativity? Definitely curiosity. Not sure about creativity, but definitely mm. I was curious. 
Okay. So it doesn't really promote creativity just yet, but it does get students curious, right? So what is curiosity? It's quite an ambiguous term, right? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. And what I've got here are four different definitions of what curiosity is, okay? But look, mm -hmm. there are words that are covered up, Sarah. <laughs> okay. I think you need the participants' help to Probably. uncover that word, to guess that word, to find that word for me. So the first one is curiosity. Mm. It's the recognition that there is something <clears throat> that we want to know. I think this one is unknown. Super. Yes, of course, we, we have this unknown thing. We want to know all about it. Now, the second one is difficult, okay? Mm, or mm, that needs to be resolved. Shall I give you a clue with the first one? Yeah, please do. I'll show, I'll show it. Ambiguity. Okay. Or... Um, uncertainty. Super. Something yeah. we're not sure about, right? Okay. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, the next one is something or pleasure from learning something new. Now think about children when they learn something new and they're always curious about the world around them. What is excitement. it? Excitement. Yeah. It's gotta be excitement, okay? Absolutely. And desire to seek by asking questions. Ah, uh, this is information, right? Yeah, the questions, okay. curiosity and questions go together. Yeah, like all right. So when we think of children, you know, this is something that they seem to be born with. They're really curious about the world around them, forever asking questions, exciting, excited about learning more, right? So this is something Absolutely. that we really need to add into our lessons. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, Sarah, it's not all good news. There's a little problem, okay? Jiru says, Children's curiosity diminishes as they move through formal education and levels of expressed curiosity is virtually absent by the time students are around 10 years old. So this is in school, not necessarily at home. So in effect, we're actually educating curiosity out of our students. And that's not great news, is it? No, it doesn't sound good, but I just want to know why this happens. Mm. Yeah, I think this comes from us being sort of in a system that has right or wrong answers. Yeah, and mm -hmm. this is a system that usually has a summative exam or assessment at the end of school. And so we're kind of teaching towards that a lot. I think students are not encouraged to question as much as they could be but are asked questions instead. You know, teachers always asking questions that they know the answers to. Mm -hmm. And then um, Hoffenbeck says, there's an acute lack of practical and accessible information for teachers as to how they can support each student to develop these skills in their everyday practice. So this links to a sort of lack of teacher education, teacher training. Mm, this certainly wasn't present in any of my teacher training courses when I was training to be a teacher, how to get students curious and how to maintain their curiosity. So it's really yeah. interesting. Same, 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 same. But curiosity is important. OK, now I'm going to give you a little challenge now, Sarah. <laughs> okay. <Back. clears throat> now, I'm going to give you some answers to one question. OK. okay. Um, it's some information about the question, okay? So I will I will read them out and then you have to guess what the question is, okay? Okay, got it. All right. All right, so it increases attention, motivation and engagement. Mm -hmm. It also increases persistence and self-determination. It improves concentration and encourages critical thinking and it promotes better well-being and collaboration between peers and children with higher levels of curiosity are more likely to explore share their interests and express excitement and finally it is the cornerstone 
of creative thinking. What do you think the question is? I think it's something like, why should we, as educators, encourage curiosity in the classroom, something like this? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Why is it so important for teachers to encourage curiosity? Right. Okay, so we can see that it's really important, fundamental, that we ensure that we're encouraging curiosity in our classrooms. But how do we do it, right? This is the key question. How does it work in practice and first of all we need to think about our um, questioning okay or how we get students to ask questions as you said earlier see we often ask the questions whereas we should be encouraging students to ask us or their peers questions okay one thing we can do is introduce a wall of wonder now this can be something that's physically displayed in the classroom there could be a dedicated space for this if you teach face to face if you teach online you might decide to use um you know something like jamboard or padlet or something and this is where you introduce the topic that you're teaching anything that comes up in the course book or anything that you choose and students write down all the questions that they have about this topic right um, and there's no such thing as a silly question they can ask whatever they want and they display it on the wall you can see here that I was teaching my students about whales and this is what they came up with now the thing is we've also got to help our students ask good questions or understand what a good question looks like and to do this we can introduce something called a question continuum to help them out. So you can see on the vertical axis, we have complexity. How difficult is that question to answer? Or does it require more complex thought? So we can see that the question, are whales shy, is more complex to answer than what do whales eat, right? And then at the bottom, you've got the interest level. So we can see that how deep can whales swim is more interesting to our students than what do whales eat, okay? And the question that's the most complex and the most interesting and where maybe students can spend their time is this one, do whales have different accents? So students then go off to investigate. Now, questioning doesn't end there. We can also encourage students to flip it. In other words, they give the answer or we give the answer and they provide the question, just like you did with me earlier. We can also get them to practice reversal thinking. For example, instead of asking our students, do you believe in ghosts? You'd ask, do ghosts believe in us? Or do dogs walk us or do we walk dogs? Or instead of how can we make an argument better or solve an argument, how can we make an argument worse? Or how can we be slower at learning new words instead of how can we learn more, uh, new words more easily? And part of this is, is fun and silly, but also requires curiosity, right? It really makes mm. you think. Yeah. Now, the other type of question we can introduce to our students is something called funk. Now, thanks are questions that don't really have an answer. They're ambiguous. They're kind of weird. For example, what colour is Thursday? See, how would you answer this? Ooh, I, I'd say orange. Yeah? I yeah. Think it's blue, you see? So um. this gets students comfortable in ambiguity, but also quite curious about their partner's answers as well. Yeah, I bet that okay. causes a a lot of conversation yeah yeah right know why you think it's blue yeah exactly yeah. so our session today is about curiosity and creative thinking creativity as well okay and we've talked a lot about curiosity but what about creativity I've made my own wonder wall about the topic curiosity and I was hoping you could help me answer the questions that I have okay I can try yep all right, so a question that I have about creativity is, well, is everyone capable of it, everyone? Or is it sort of artists, musicians? What would yeah. you say? It's a good question. I mean, like the short answer is everyone capable of creative thinking? Yes, absolutely. And I think this links to artists and musicians because I think when we think of creative people or creativity in general, we tend to think of great artists or musicians 
kind of genius and uh, really artistic talents going on. And we think of maybe the end product, like a beautiful painting or a spectacular dance or a beautiful poem, <clears throat> when actually we're thinking about real talent and a product instead of perhaps the process involved in that. So myself as an artist, for example, the creative thinking is not in the final product, but the process of actually doing that. Got it. So in that case, if it's a process, then it can be taught, right? Yeah, exactly. And if we, we, if we move away from artists as well, we think about a mechanic with my like banged up kind of secondhand car going to my mechanic. He has to have creative thinking skills in order to fix my car. And equally, you know, us in education, teachers stretching a paycheck to the end of the month, we've got to be quite creative with our finances to get there, right? Yeah, so exactly. It's absolutely a skill that we can teach in the classroom. Hmm. Okay, so it's not to do with kind of sponta spontaneity or being a, a sort of genius of sorts. We're all no. capable of, right? Okay, so I also want to know whether you think it's best to work alone on a creative project or whether we should collaborate what do you think about this one? Definitely involves lots of collaboration. I mean, it's about bouncing ideas to and from each other, isn't it? We have better uh, a process when we do that. We do that at l -tonics all the time. And um, Guy Claxton reminds us that every, every very creative person has at least one other person in their life who doesn't think they're mad. You know, <laughs> there's, there's someone always there kind of like bouncing ideas off. So yeah, definitely collaboration. Okay. And, and the last question I have is, is kind of, you know, how I used to think as a student, but how my students also think as well. And it's why can't I think of anything when my teacher says, you know, draw a picture, write a poem, make a poster, I just go blank, I freeze up a bit. Why is that? Yeah, we do this a lot. And again, it's like that kind of misconception of creativity that we just put a pencil or a pen or a paintbrush in a child's hand. And that's, that's creative. But actually, um, you know, it's not about freedom and spontaneity all the time or a blank canvas. That can be a little bit confronting. Uh, and where do you start? Where, where's the creative process in that? We're not really developing that or fostering that just by saying draw or write. So what we need to do is give creative constraints. And we'll look at this in a second later okay. in, in, the, in the session where students then have a kind of puzzle to solve. And in doing that, they're thinking creatively. Mm, okay, so it's not about absolute freedom no. or a blank canvas, it's about giving certain constraints. Okay, so I also want to know then, if creative thinking is a process, what do creative thinking skills look like in practice? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we need to sort of think about what creative thinkers do. And, you know, first of all, it's looking for many possible answers, not just one. And, and there isn't an answer. You know, you're finding an answer. And it's allowing ourselves to make wild and crazy suggestions and being OK with that, having a brave and safe space to be able to do that in the classroom, too. Not judging ideas early on in the process. So kind of, you know, not, not to go, oh, no, that's silly and move it to the side. Just kind of keep playing with it, daydream, doodle. Um, and then <clears throat> making lots and lots of suggestions that are workable and silly or seemingly so at the beginning. Making mistakes is a huge part of creative thinking and then learning from what didn't work as well as what did. Yeah. Okay. So the big question is, how do we help develop creative thinkers? And we've actually spent the first half of this session looking at curiosity and that being a massive cornerstone of creativity, having or fostering this sense of wonder and curiosity. And we looked at different ways we can do that with questioning. There are other two elements as well that we can do, which is encourage students to observe in detail the world around us. And as I just said before, applying certain constraints within tasks. So mm -hmm. encouraging students to observe, how can we do that, Sarah? 
Well, observation is interesting because, you know, Da Vinci, who's one of the most creative thinkers of, of all time, um, did this all the time in his notebooks. If you've got a chance uh, and you can Google Da Vinci's notebooks, they're really illuminating. And what he was doing was looking at what was in front of him, but not just looking at the world as it is, but imagining other possibilities. And we can try and get our young learners to look at things in slightly different ways, okay? And this can be things that we can adapt from a course book as well. So I'm gonna show you something, all right? Now, I opened my course book, Curious Kids People's Five book, and we've got this grammar point, okay? And this is something that, of course, we would do in the classroom with our students. We're teaching them comparatives. We're talking about wild animals and maybe they've practiced the, the grammar and done a little bit of language work already. Mm -hmm. So where can we go then to encourage them to observe? OK, so here are my animals. Where do you think they live? See, what about the hippo? OK, Which let's animal? get the participants involved. The hippo, number one, two, three, four, or five. I reckon it's either one or four. We've got river. Let's okay, let's go with four. Lovely. Good. What about the rhino? The rhino, what do we think? Number one. Lovely. Okay, this one's difficult. Penguin. It's either two or three, isn't it? I'm going to mm. go four, two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've got the Antarctica there. Parrot. Parrots Tropicana. It's got to be the yeah. old palm tree there. Yeah. Absolutely. Five. So then the polar bear in the Arctic is here, right? Yeah. Okay. And these are the habitats. And of course, you can ask your students some follow up questions, you know, which animals live in a hotter or colder climate to practice that grammar point. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But all right, let's really observe these habitats where these animals live. All right. So see, choose a habitat, but don't tell me which one it is. OK. OK. And I want you to think about the sounds that you would hear if you were there. OK. OK. And you're going to tell me what sounds that you hear, but don't say what makes the sound. Actually, tell me the sound. OK, we're going to guess where you are. OK. Um, all right. <laughs> Crack, crunch, crunch, crunch. Okay, that's got to be number two, right? Yeah. Lovely. Okay. Now, this is mine. I want you to read it out, okay? okay? And then tell me where you think I am. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Mm, okay, I reckon it's number one, the Savannah. Absolutely. Yes. I am. I'm in the grasslands in the savannah. OK, and here are some that my students wrote. OK, they chose a habitat. They really thought about the sounds that they could hear. They didn't write what made the sounds, but they tried to write the sound itself, an onomatopoeic poem, right? And then their partner had to guess where they are. Now, of course, here they're observing the scene, but they're not just looking at the visuals. They're thinking about other senses that might come into play as well. You could also explore touch what kind of textures might you feel and this is getting students to observe something in a slightly different way to what we normally do right yeah and then some follow-on tasks that we could do is that students write an onomatopoeic poem for where they live and then their partner could guess you know is it the city is it the countryside what do they have in their bedroom this kind of stuff or students could even build the habitat of their choice out of the materials that they have available I kind of want to do that now. That's brilliant. <laughs> Please right. don't, we've got to finish this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's encouraging students to observe. Mm -hmm. Let's look at how we can apply certain constraints within TAS to foster okay. uh, creative thinking. So there are two ways that we can do this. We can apply content constraints. So this might be providing prompts for students to work on. It could be questions, particular questions for students to answer. It could be inspiration for the students to write about or respond to, including images um, and including a problem solving element as well. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, we have structural constraints as well. So this could be something like how many words to use in a sentence or a paragraph, and it could be syllable counting as well, like you'd find in a haiku poem, for example. Okay. So 
<clears throat> let's take a look at this opportunity to adapt our course book. So Sarah, you had one with your little grammar point and what you could do after that. This is what we can do after some text work. So we have a text here, it's called Save Our Animals and it's about snow leopard, orangutans and blue whales and how they're vulnerable and endangered. And it's very factual and underneath this text here we have some typical kind of comprehension questions that will help the students understand the content of that text. And then perhaps typically we might move on to some post-text activity like draw an endangered animal, um, you know, say why it's endangered, or for example, make a poster campaign to help endangered animals, etc. But we're kind of walking down into that pathway of kind of draw a picture or make a poster. <clears throat> And too much freedom. Yeah, exactly. And so we need those constraints to really foster this creative thinking, because again, it's not about just the product. It's also the process or very much about the process. And this is a great technique for exploring this further in in class with these kind of make a poster, make images. OK, it's called bending breaking and blending and these are our constraints okay so let me explain what bending is so bending is when we have an original thing it could be an object or an image and we sort of twist it out of shape so we play with the size and the shape of it this is uh, Slinkachu, he's a great street artist he does this he's got little little tiny little figures on installations in the street then we have breaking. This is when something whole is taken apart and then kind of assembled with its fragments back into place or in different places. Of course, you know, Cubism, Picasso is a great example of this. And then finally, blending. This is when we have two or more sources, and it could be images as well, um, and we blend them in novel ways, just like Dali has here. But of course, as we said, we don't need to be genius artists like these guys we can see on the screen. We can actually get our students to uh, take some of these blending, breaking, blending concepts to make now their awareness poster. So, for example, <clears throat> I got my students to think about the orangutan, the blue whale and the snow leopard. And from the text, they take something that um, has what well, basically their biggest jet danger, what makes them most vulnerable. So my students chose the fact that the deforestation and the digger um, is really, really decreasing their habitat. So they played with this idea of an orangutan and a little toy digger. And of course, this has much more impact. They're bending it, they're bending the shapes, playing with the, the size of these things. It has great impact. Equally with the with the blue whale here, he's, he's pink here for some reason, but um, <clears throat> they, the students thought that plastic, plastic pollution was the biggest threat to blue whale. So they started to bend and play and blend with these plastic, uh, what, what happens when the whale is small, let's put the whale in the bag. And of course it comes up with this beautiful image. Equally, we can break. So this is when we've got fragments. We take one bit from one and one bit from the other. This is about the snow leopard and the fact that it's being, you know, it's, it's danger is the poaching of, of snow leopards. And so we've got this fragment of the paw and the gun, and we put that together and look at this, look at this impactful image. And so the students, we've given the students a, a new way of expressing themselves visually by using these constraints. And ultimately, we've got a better product at the end of it as well. As a follow on task, the students could display their work around the classroom in a gallery format and they visit each one and they can say what the animal is saying, like the orangutan and the blue whale had a little bubble. They can actually put what they, they're saying there. Or they could just write the title underneath each animal. Equally, um, they could write an accompanying tweet or text written by their animal of choice 
or describing the threat to them. And this could have a structural constraint, for example, 10 words or less. And here's an example here. This is about the snow leopard. All right, so in this session, we have explored what curiosity and creativity are and how important they are, and some ideas of how we can put this into practice in our classrooms. If you want to know our wonderfully creative resources, here they are. And if you want to know more about creativity or indeed what we do, or you want us to bring much more creativity in your educational settings, you can contact us. Thank you so much for your participation. Yes, thank you, everybody. Hello. And hi. that's Will. Hi. Hey. hi, hi, hi. Thank you so much. Once again, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. So inspirational, I think. It takes me back to, to my childhood as well. It got me thinking about how was I taught this? Was I, was, did they even think, did teachers think this way? Mm. You know, <laughs> years ago, 60 years ago when I was in the classroom. Uh, was, uh, do you know what I mean? Was this actually happening back then? Is this I don't think so. New stuff? No, it's not. I don't it think was. so. I mean, it was, it was, you know, to when we started exploring what, what is, what creativity particularly is, I realized I had a lot of misunderstandings about what it was. Yeah. Same. And also had never, I don't think, been taught any creative thinking skills explicitly in the classroom. And, you know, it's not just for the English language classroom. It, it's multidisciplinary. It, it can appear anywhere. Um, right. And of yeah. course, it's so important for life outside the classroom as well, right? Um, and it's something that I think we're maybe a bit scared of because we think that we're not creative. But now we know that it's within all of us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got to make, and it's, and it's actually, we're talking to the people that are in this room. It's our, well, I, I believe it's a responsibility of a teacher to, um, do what they can to make sure they don't educate them out of you, you, I, I kept thinking of ken robinson when you were saying that ken robinson's yeah, amazing yes. talk about educating yeah. kids out of, edu uh, out of their creativity and um it's the job of a teacher isn't it to make sure that we don't fall into that trap although it's yeah. difficult sometimes isn't it? i think people are so constrained by yeah by, i was gonna you know, say black and white investments down the road that, that yeah i think we do put a, a bit too much on the shoulders of teachers. I think it is a bigger system. There are lots of ministries of education and, you know, that are, are working now towards putting more creative thinking skills into the curriculum mm -hmm. around the world because it is so important for employers yeah. you know, to have this, this strength, this skill. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I think, yeah, you know, I think we tend to put it all on teachers' shoulders when mm. perhaps it, sh it, you know, we look, we need to look at the bigger picture as well. I think teacher trainers, teacher training courses need to have this a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we need to remember also, it, it's, it's very inclusive. I mean, it, it's, it's something that all children can achieve in different ways, no matter what they have going on or no matter what their English language level is and 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 all of that kind of stuff. It's it's yeah. achievable by all, even though the, the the results will be very different. And that's kind of the nice part about it as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Another person came to mind while you were talking actually. So Ken Robinson for sure. I mean yeah. I was just in love with that guy, just everything he did for the world. Um but also, I don't know why, but Lynn Manuel Miranda kept coming up in my head. Do you know him? No, I don't. I don't know. Like he he comes to he comes to mind as a really, really genuinely knows how to be creative guy. Lynn Manuel Miranda writes music for he wrote Hamilton, the musical. Um, he wrote mm. Moana songs, he writes lots of Disney music. Um, he did he he's done loads of stuff and he's got he talked a lot about creativity and, and how his best themes come come to his head when he's doing the dishes and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> just some of the things you were saying were ringing with some of the things that he teaches about creativity as well. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great you, resource. You can, you can get into sort of neuro kind of, you, it's the science of creativity as well. And they talk about that aha moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's a process and, and, and that's the sort of thinking skills that we can we can foster in the classroom but there is that sort of aha moment and it might happen I don't know if it happens to you but it happens to me like in the middle of the night yeah yeah, yeah. I wake up and go oh that 
that's a brilliant yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay, all right. I think um, we need to start moving on with our chin wagon. Yes. Thank you, um, everyone. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.